Hi. This reading is brought to you by Strong Women, Strange Worlds, which is a group of authors supporting authors. Our mission is to elevate the voices of women and other underrepresented gender identity authors of science fiction, fantasy, and horror through events like our bi-monthly virtual quick read sessions. You can find out more about Strong Women, Strange Worlds in the handout we've provided in the chat and by visiting our website, a link to which will be added to the chat. I am your host today, Sarah Smith, and you can find out more about me in the provided handout. Today we'll be featuring six authors, Nancy Jane Moore, Premi Mohammed, Josie Malone, Shirley Chan, Jennifer Brozek, and Amber Royer. Our first reader is Nancy Jane Moore. Nancy Jane Moore is the author of the For the Good of the Realm and The Weave, both published by Aqueduct Press. Her short fiction has appeared in a number of venues. In addition to writing, she holds a fourth degree black belt in Aikido and teaches empowerment self-defense. Nancy, take it away. Thank you. Um, at this point in the story, Anna and Azamir of the Queen's Guard are on their way back to the capital, uh, capital of the realm with the Queen's necklace, which they have retrieved from her lover, the Countess of Beaufort. Bad rains have delayed them, rains that seem to be unnatural, but they have received assistance from a witch and the rain has stopped. But now four King's Guardsmen block the last bridge to the capital. And so we start there. After we have defeated six, what are four, Anna said. She touched her side to make certain that the necklace, which lay in a purse under her tunic, was secure. Azimir watched her move, then smiled. Let us write down. I have a plan. She explained her idea to Anna, who joined her in the smile. Though you may be at risk if they all follow you. Ah, if it gets too bad, I will surrender. I do not have the necklace. They cantered down the hill. Madame, Roland de Barth inclined his head in a hint at formal greeting. We have been sent to escort you to the king. Our apologies to her, his majesty, but we have other orders that take precedence, Anna said, replied. John Paul was next to Roland. He did not appear hampered by his injury from the previous week's duel. He smiled at Azimir, the smile of a man who has looked forward to a rematch. The other two sat on their horses quietly. Anna had dueled with both and knew them to be worthy opponents. I'm afraid we must insist, Roland said. Azimir was moving away from her. Anna saw her pat her side as if she were checking to see if she carried something there. The gesture did not go unnoticed by Jean Paul. I am afraid we must decline, Anna said. Roland drew his sword and Anna drew hers almost as quickly. And at that moment, when the other three guardsmen were watching Roland and Anna to see what might happen next, Azimir spurred her, spurred her horse straight across the bridge. She carries the necklace, Jean Paul shouted, turning his horse and turning off in pursuit. And before Roland could stop them, the other two followed behind him. Roland remained. I doubt that she does, he said to Anna. I do not think she would have run if she did, for her chances of escaping all three seem small. And she is not a fool. Will you surrender to me now, madame? If I would not surrender to four, why should I surrender to one? She dismounted quickly, sword in hand. Roland leapt quiet, quick, lightly from his own mouth, and they crossed swords. Anna had found Roland a worthy opponent in their first encounter, when neither she nor he had truly wanted to fight. Now that they met in earnest, she saw that he equaled her in skill, or perhaps even surpassed her. Every opening she found was blocked against her, as if it had been shown only to draw her in. Every cut she made missed by a hair's breadth. 
At last she saw his arm go up. It thought sure she would stab him. But as she came in, he slifted, shifted slightly so that her sword met air. She stumbled a bit. His blade cut across her tunic, sliced open the purse underneath, and the necklace came tumbling out. Roland dropped to the ground, holding the sword high to keep Anna back, and grabbed for the necklace with his left hand. But he had taken his eyes off Anna when he reached out, making it easy for her to knock his sword offline. She stepped on his hand and the necklace. He grimaced, but did not cry out and tried to pull free, but Anna ground her boot more firmly into his hand. He could do nothing with his blade from his awkward position on the ground. Do you yield, sir? Roland let his sword drop to the ground. I yield. Anna took her foot from his hand and knelt to retrieve the necklace, keeping her eye and her sword on him as she did so. She tucked the jewels away. You must forget that you have seen that, she said. Madame, I cannot do that. Come, you yield it. Give me your word, sir. I yield it to your mercy and I remain at it, madame, but I must tell the king what I have seen. I am sworn to him, and to do less would be to betray my oath. Honor demands it. Then I will be forced to kill you, for my honor demands that I take this to the queen without the king's knowledge. So be it then. His face showed no trace of fear. Anna raised her sword, then let it fall. Pick up your sword. I will not kill you like this. He picked it up. I have no desire to kill you either, but I suppose that only one of us can leave here alive. I am sworn to the king and you to the queen. And both of us to the realm, Anna said suddenly. Indeed, both of us to the realm. And that will resolve our situation, for we both have duty to the realm. What do you mean? Sir, the king and queen were married to unite the realm, not their hearts. Were they not? Indeed, so I understand. So a flirtation by one or the other means little. That the queen may have given her heart to another is of no true importance to the king. Ah, but the evidence of it humiliates him, Roland said. Yes, if he is forced to take notice of it. And if others know. But if the truth remains unknown to all. But he has sent me to discover it, and honor demands that I follow my orders. Honor be damned, said Anna de Gart. We speak too much of honor. Roland's eyes opened wide. You and I have fought twice because of honor, when we had no quarrel of our own. <clears throat> and would it be honorable to divide the realm again, because we both must keep our honor? What happens if the queen is dishonored, sir? At best, she is pushed aside, removed from power. And who fills the space that she leaves? For we both know that the king cannot rule alone, without aid. Who, I ask you? The Hierophant, Roland said slowly. And it was her eminence who told the king of the Countess of Beaufort. In the best of circumstances, we shall be ruled by the Hierophant. But surely you know the followers of the queen will not countenance such an outcome. I, for one, will fight to regain her honor, and I will not be alone. The realm will once again divide, and this time we are likely to end up in civil war. That would be a great evil, said Roland. So we must choose between our personal honor and the greater good of the realm, Anna said. Forget you saw this bottle. Tell the king you met me on the road and found no evidence that I had done aught but travel outside the capital, as my captain will tell you. He hesitated. It is very difficult to sacrifice my honor. My God, man, I'm asking you to sacrifice it for your duty. It would be more dishonorable if you and I held on to our personal honor and failed in our duty to the realm. So it would. My word then, madame, and may I escort you back to the capital? I would be honored, sir. And... To find out what happens next, you'll have to read the book. <laughs> thank you. Boy, thank you. Thank you. Um, our second reader is Primi Mohammed. Primi Mohammed is an Indo Caribbean scientist and speculative fiction author based in Edmonton, Alberta. She is the author of the Beneath the Rising series. 
several novellas, and a raft of short fiction. She can be found on Twitter at Primisaurus and on her website at PrimiMohammed.com. Take Thank it away. Thank you so, so much for inviting me. Uh, so I'll be reading from my latest book, The Annual Migration of Clouds, which came out in September 2021. And uh, it's the story of kind of a post-post-apocalyptic climate disaster. And the main character, Reed, uh, who has an unusual uh, disease, I guess we could call it a hereditary symbiont, and her best friend, Henrik, are in Chapter 7 and are going to go down to the river valley and maybe hunt for some rabbits. By the time I meet Henrik over by the drop, I am tired and cranky from the morning's work and skipping lunch. He doesn't look like he's faring much better. First things first, we must get that out of the way. You look like shit, I tell him. You too. And you need a haircut, that rat's nest. But so I can look like you. You wish, he says loftily, because I have walked into it. You could look like me. Up yours. Up what, I always wonder, he says. I mean, yours could be anything. I don't know. It's, it's just such a mom thing to say, so it must be something really terrible. The stairs down to the valley gleam in the long afternoon light, soft-edged gold. Two lanes marked in dark parallel smears, going up, going down. Every couple of years, they have to be replumbed, leveled, and shored up for the ground underneath them has been eaten away far below their original footings. But here, it's either climb the stairs or take a rope down, and we've both been rope burned enough. We hang onto the railings and descend slowly, putting both feet on each step like toddlers, ignoring the magpies that flutter down to laugh at us. Very funny. Magpies always seem to want to know what you're doing, and once they know what they want to supervise, go away, I tell them. You're terrible spies. Don't talk to them, you'll only encourage them. Where did you read that? Some old lady told me. I don't just read, you know. We wind between stumps and saplings, step through dogwood, rose, handsy willow, batting away the light branches, dried out and stiff from the long winter. Sap has not risen yet, and the few inches of remaining soil are still frozen above the bedrock. Strong, sweet musk of last fall's leaves, exposed by the melting snow and forming slick rugs under our careful feet. A smell of childhood running wild in the dust and the smoke sliding on these leaves in the understory. Patches of snow remain in the shade, dirty brown and gray, but the droplets that melt from the icy trees are impossibly clear, sparkling and catching the sun and flying into our upturned faces like rain. What did you bring? I ask. A uh, sling? Spear? You? I found a couple of arrows, but they're all shit. From two summers ago, remember when McKinnon had that workshop thing and we all made like a hundred of them? I glance at the bow on his back, white PVC like mine, smudged with grimy fingerprints. The string doesn't look too good, but I guess if his arrows are shit too, it won't matter. Mostly, I think we came to get our legs back under us. Like going back to sea. It's funny, he begins, because like, back then, they didn't even eat rabbit. You never see it in the cookbooks. Yeah, and if you wanted one, you could just shoot it with a gun. Back then, back then. Back then and their guns. We don't even know what we mean exactly when we say back then. Or back then, capitalized, like Anno Domini. What time period, years. Yeah, Shinmalia's long ago girlhood. Before CAD, before the Ultra Storms. The big one, and then the next big one. And then the next, and the next, and the next often but not always roaring into the river valley like a giant stubbing his toe and collapsing into impotent rage and debris on our side. They didn't cause the end of everything, we figured. Everything was ending anyway. But neither is it very clear what did cause the rift between back then and now. So much burned and blew away, leaving no trace like a carcass that didn't fossilize. As we mine out the landfills, at least they left us a lot of plastic to reuse. That was thoughtful. And burrow into basements and archives, seeking the books that our ancestors did not burn to survive the winters. You feel it, sometimes? Rage, filling you like an updraft of hot air from a fire, lifting you from the shoulders or blowing through you like a tornado. Rage that we missed it, 
missed it all and rage at those who got to have it in the specific way that took it from us. And we don't even know what it is, only that we want to get back to it. And we never will because they made that impossible. What has been broken has been broken in a way that can no longer be fixed. Reading about it all in novels, smartphones, internet, satellites, the ISS, movies, cruises, road trips, texting trains, flying in planes over countries with the cloud shadows moving dark and wet over the land like ink, but also all the things they wrote in there that they did not mean to write about because they were too normal, letting us look at them from the corner of their eyes. Restaurants, rice, dumpsters, condoms, ozons, irrigation, pensions, bananas. I think, my Christ, imagine a world where you could fear flying. Henrik feels it too. The rage, I mean, the upward pull of it, when you know there's no starting over. When you know that everything we needed to start over was thrown away or burnt up decades before we were born. We can't have any of that. Malia told me, They said to us, we'll keep the lights on as long as we can. And they did. You could flip a switch and at least there was light. We could not run our stoves or our fridges, but light, always light. Then brownouts, then blackouts. The panels broke, and no one could fix them. No more diesel for generators, and no more coming. Click, 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 her long, beautiful willow gold hand, gesturing at the dead switch on the wall. Till finally, we all had to admit, nothing was coming back on. It was dark always. Now, babies crawl around without fear and put their tongues into the sockets like there was milk inside. Mm. Oh, boy. Thank you. Thank you, Primi. Our third reader is Josie Malone. Josie says, I live at Horse Country Farm, a family-owned riding stable in the Cascade foothills. I work hard during the day and write in the evenings. When I can't write, due to the overwhelming needs and pressures of the real world, words and stories fill my mind. Even when I muck the barn, I think about books in progress and map out the writing in my mind. Go, Josie. Um, thank you. Uh, Trail Through Time is book five in my Liberty Valley series. Um, and what I should say about Liberty Valley is that from the time it was settled in the 1860s to the present, life isn't exactly normal. Um, although the people who live there deny that magic takes place. Despite time traveling, love bringing spells, witches, wizards, and shape shifting neighbors. Uh, you can enjoy a visit or a lifetime in the valley. It's always an adventure, but you need to watch out for the time portals or you'll be in the old west before you know it. Uh, in, re in Trail Through Time, Kyle Morgan uh, has discovered that um, a woman that he's only seen in pictures, is in mortal danger from a serial killer. So he has to convince her that he's traveled more than 100 years to protect her. And of course, she doesn't believe him. And we're going to start with chapter one. Uh, let's see. Civilian and police cars filled the parking lot around the funeral home, although the memorial service wouldn't start for almost two hours. Nina Armstrong parked her 20-year-old Ford Ranger in the space reserved for her and switched off the engine. She dreaded facing everyone, but what choice did she have? My best friend died trying to bring the man who raped and battered me to justice. Quit whining and whinging and go for it. She would do the same for me. Taking a moment, Nina reassured Puka, her half-grown tricolor collie mix, who sat in the passenger seat, that she would be back as soon as she could manage it. She knew she was adhering to an old-fashioned code of conduct that most service dog trainers would say was unnecessary, but somehow she couldn't take a puppy into a memorial service. There would be other times and places to socialize Puka. Nina clambered out of the truck and lingered for a moment, locking the driver's door. At least she was off the crutches. She hadn't been able to make herself wear anything but black jeans, a subdued top under her black western-style jacket. Regardless of the occasion, she doubted she'd ever wear a dress again. 
Last month, she had hysterics when her brother-in-law tugged gently on her braid at a horse show, causing onlookers to stare at her. Her mother and stepfather suggested she continue to avoid crowds if she couldn't control her emotional meltdowns. The following afternoon, she visited Ginger Taylor and demanded the former hairdresser shave her head. Ginger refused, saying a cap style cut was enough and promised to deliver the chocolate brown waist length braid to the local Locks of Love wig making drive. It was time to quit stalling, Nina told herself sternly. Sooner or later, someone would see her standing by the truck in the parking lot and try to escort her inside. Taking a deep breath, she headed into the lobby and looked around. A photograph of Beth Chambers in her formal cop blues stood on an easel near a door. Nina winced, remembering the day she'd taken the picture. Afterward, the two of them had gone to lunch at Beth's favorite restaurant, Billy Bob's where they enjoyed giant slabs of cheesecake with their coffee, not bothering to feel guilty because they'd split one of the huge specialty burgers and a mountain of hand-cut crispy french fries first. In the room, several other easels held large pictures of Beth. Many showed her in different army uniforms. In one corner was a candid shot of her in jeans and a western shirt, holding her horse's reins, while Luke, her retired canine partner, stood by the pair. The light gray Arabian nuzzled her arm and Nina recalled her friend always had horse cookies in a coat pocket reserved especially for Tigger. Blinking back the tears, Nina went past the cluster of police officers to the front of the room. Beth's foster father, Will Dawson, stood there with one of his many relatives, a petite brunette that Nina recognized as Audra Dawson, Beth's favorite cousin. Despite wearing a formal black suit, he looked like a silver-haired singing cowboy with one of his favorite stepsons. Will smiled and reached out to hug Nina when she joined him. Thanks for coming. I'm glad you made it. Nina slipped out of the sideways embrace, hoping she didn't offend the older man. But she couldn't bear to be touched, even five months after the attack. Beth would hate all this fuss. Yep, she sure would. She always threw a fit about the falderall when we got together every time before she deployed. Will smiled all the way up to warm brown eyes, but this way her friends can say goodbye and wish her well. And the family can too, Audra said, turning with a friendly nod. I'm Audra Dawson Watkins now. Don't worry about missing my wedding. Joe and I eloped, and the relatives don't know what to make of that. Nina nodded, glancing around and seeing several more members of the Dawson clan. I saw Joe at the vet clinic when I took in my puppy for his shots last time. He was nice. He even gave Puka the teddy bear that he chewed up. That's my husband, Audra agreed happily. Animals first, and people barely second. He'll be back as soon as he straightens out the chaplain. Joe will find a tactful way to explain that nobody will be happy if he opts for one of those surface speeches that are so popular and make it obvious that he really didn't know Beth, even if she was sent for him for counseling for her PTSD. The conversation eased some of Nina's nervousness, but she still had to ask, have you heard anything more from the district attorney? Does he have anything new to say about Gary Smith? Oh, the fellow still claims Beth is alive and well in 1888, Little said. Detective Watkins assures us that Smith's trying for an insanity plea, but he won't get it. He had her coat and everything she kept in the pockets for trophies, plus there was more evidence when they found his saddlebags in that dead horse in the National Forest. There's no way Beth would give up her things, Nina said. She got her man. Smith will spend the rest of his life behind bars once he goes to trial. Will drew an antique gold watch out of his pocket, rubbing the case with a callous thumb. You're right, she did get her man, and all of the Dawsons can live with that. Time to stop blaming yourself for what she did, sweetness. But it's my fault she tracked him into the National Forest and got herself killed, and he said, I'd never want to hurt. Same goes for you, Audra said. She'd hate it if she thought you blamed yourself. She always took care of everyone, even before she became a cop. 
It was her job and she stepped up. Again, no blame attaches to you. Nina felt some of her tension ease. She prepared to be criticized and judged, not hear this much understanding on so many levels. She glanced across the room and saw Joe Watkins coming toward them. He'd never been a big guy, barely six foot. He was still lean and wiry, accompanied by a younger man in a dark suit, bearing a black cowboy hat. Was that the minister? It couldn't be. Not with that hat. Audra turned her smile on me. Nina, you remember my husband, don't you? And this is a friend of ours and Beth's, Kyle Morgan. Nina tensed for a moment, concerned he might try to shake her hand. Instead, he stood still and then slowly smiled until it touched his dark brown eyes. While she didn't smile back at him, she relaxed again. He wasn't a giant of a man, shorter than both Joe and Will, but three inches taller than she was at five feet four. Faint amusement trickled through her. No wonder he needed a hat to make himself bigger. Sun-streaked blonde hair reached his broad shoulders, and she realized it was longer than hers. She noticed the faded line of a jagged scar that sliced his right cheek and wondered what happened. Was it some kind of war injury? Had he and Beth served together in Afghanistan? Where did you meet Beth, Nina asked. I don't remember her mentioning you. In the woods on one of her hunting trips. Nina met his gaze, wary now. Beth didn't hunt. He means a camping trip, Audra said. You're her best friend. You know, she used to head for the hills whenever she could around the holidays because she hated fireworks after all those army tours in the Middle East. They triggered her PTSD. Then why didn't he say that? Kyle shrugged. Wasn't sure what you folks called it. And she was downright unsociable when I stumbled into her camp looking for my brother. Her dog attacked me, knocked me down and held me in the dirt. Not really. A burst of rare laughter bubbled up inside Nina. What did your brother do? Laughed. He never was a sensitive sort. Probably why he and Bethany get along so well. You mean got along. Here's stung and she blinked hard. Now she had another reason to hate herself. She deprived her best friend of a man who undoubtedly would have been her soulmate and given her the happy ever after she dreamed of and rarely mentioned. Nina glanced around the room. Is he here? No, Brad isn't much for ceremony. And we'll stop there. Okay. Thank you, Josie. So let's move on to our fourth reader, Shirley Chan. Shirley Chan loves stories, telling, reading, and writing them. She grew up in Eastern fairy tales and then found Anderson, Grimm, and Lang. She has since graduated to longer prose, but never forgot the fables that started her literate journey. She lives in Brooklyn, works a regular day job, and lives the fantastical whenever she can, imagined or otherwise. Shirley, over to you. Hello. So this is from the first chapter of my book. And at this point in the story, the youngest daughter of the Jay King is missing from the Jay court, uh, which is the palace and the heart of the Middle Kingdom. Monkey, the troublemaker, has a lead as to where she is. And so he's gone to investigate. <clears throat> Monkey loved to fly. And he made good time getting to Falling Girl's house. He made sure to fly casually, just in case anyone was watching, and even managed to check in on some of his minions along the way. He waited and watched a nauseating farewell scene between the bride and the groom, and then watched some more as the bride did some work inside the house. He didn't get a good look at her until she stepped outside and sat on a stoop to peel and chop vegetables. For a moment, Monkey thought he had been wrong in his suspicions. Falling girl looked like any other peasant woman preparing a meal for her husband. But then he heard it. Falling girl was humming a court song that was only now circulating among the mortals. The moon reflects my heart. You still sing like a donkey, said Monkey as he swung down from the trees. Monkey, gasped Falling girl. What are you doing here? 
Monkey bounded over and picked up a turnip. Why, princess, anyone would think you didn't wish to be found. He gnawed on the turnip and examined his one-time playmate. Monkey would never have recognized this woman as the Jade Princess. She looked mortal. Her skin was darkening, her nails were chipped, and she was chopping vegetables. Even her immortal glow seemed muted. Truly, Monkey, you must leave. Father may be tracking me through you. Monkey had been fond of all of the princesses, and not just because of the non-discovery bubble that surrounded them. However, of all the princesses, she knew was definitely Monkey's favorite partner in crime. She knew had been an active participant, and some of their special projects still had rare fruit. Yes, well, he can't do that anymore. I'm a demigod now. I passed my exams. Monkey couldn't resist a small strut. He can no more sense me than he could you. Oh, how wonderful. I hadn't heard. I hadn't been in touch, and I've been rather busy and... Busy? You've been missing for over a moon. Why, princess? What possessed you to leave court? For, for this? Monkey gestured with a turnip at the small wooden house. An immortal? Even I could never come up with such a plan to torment your father. Please, Monkey, don't scold. The princess tidied up the vegetables and put them into a bowl. Come inside before anyone sees you, and I'll try to explain. When Monkey got, or sorry, when the princess got up to enter the house, Monkey suddenly realized why she looked so mortal. Immortality was more than inheritance or state of being. It was tied to the power of the Jade King and his court. And there's no better way to disrupt that godly power than by being pregnant with a mortal child. In the end, what was there to say? Boredom, curiosity, mischief. All emotions Monkey could relate to combined to bring the Jade Princess to this state. And much to Monkey's consternation, the princess was not only pregnant, but in love. <laughs> but he's a mortal! A mortal and a cow herder! Monkey wasn't sure which was worse. The Jay Princess sighed and shrugged as only those who had to live with the consequences could do. No one chooses whom they love, Monkey, you know that. You know who must have tied the red strings and there's nothing that can be done about it now. Monkey had never thought that Kuan Yin had such forethought and planning and made a mental note to consult with her more often. Your father was rather rude to her after their affair. It was the scandal of the century. Kuan Yin was the daughter of a mortal king who caught the Jade King's eye, and after what all agreed was a mutually smitten dalliance, 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 the Jade King dispensed with her company and did not even bestow upon her the title of concubine. Not long after the breakup, Kuan Yin attained full goddess status. Many, including Monkey, believed Kuan Yin had a score to settle. The irony was, of course, the only goddesship available at the time was that of mercy and compassion. As the goddess, one of Kuan Yin's duties was to connect souls. She spun red ether and bound newborns to each other through their navel. Technically, it didn't matter how far apart in station, distance, or time the souls were. Once joined, that was that. Practically, Monkey could see very little mercy or compassion in what Kuan Yin had done to the princess. Does the mortal know who you really are? Monkey asked. He had his suspicions. Why else would she be hiding? No, the princess bit her lip. And I really don't know how to tell him. Monkey then had to sit through the litany of omissions and half-truths the princess had told in order to allay the mortal suspicions. Beautiful, rich, and virtuous maidens didn't usually fall from the sky and land at one's feet. Either the mortal was very gullible, or he knew full well the risks he was taking. You are actually happy here. 
It started as a question, but became a statement as Monkey realized this simple truth. The princess nodded and smiled. It's hard to believe, but I feel like I have a purpose here. I know it's not much, but he has such big plans. He's going to build me a loom so I can weave and make silks again, and more land so we can have a farm of our own. The princess stirred a stew pot with a vegetable she had peeled and chopped. If I had known my fortune, I would have laughed or been horrified. But now, breaking with tradition, none of the J. King's children had their fortunes cast upon birth. It would have been too convenient for the J. King to use the fortunes as a way to determine the fate of his children and thus circumvent his promise. On the other hand, the best fortunes were always the most obscure. Even if she had had her fortune cast, Monkey doubted anyone would have been able to read mortality into it. Princess, what are you going to do? Do? I'm doing what I'm doing, the princess said, said as she patted her stomach. The rest will happen as it will. And didn't that sound like an obscure fortune? So this story, the basis of the story is actually what is more commonly referred to as the Chinese Valentine story. And to find out how I end it, read on. Thank you, Shirley. Our fifth reader is Jennifer Brozak. Jennifer is a wordslinger and optimist, an author and editor, and a collector of Andy the Trench Literature Moi. <laughs> She believes the best thing about being a full-time freelance publishing industry professional is the fact that she gets to choose which 60 hours of the week she works. Visit her at jenniferbrozek.com. Take it away, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Sarah. Okay, so I'm going to be reading a, the story I'm reading from is the, from the second book in the Karen Wilson Chronicles Quartet. It's now sold in omnibus form. Set in the supernaturally active city of Kendrick, located in the Pacific Northwest, Corelli is a secondary character who becomes a main character by the last book in the series. I just liked her too much not to write more about her. It was never a good thing when her tattoo started itching. Corelli looked down at the simple line tattoo of an eye inside a pyramid on the back of her plump right hand. When the all-seeing eye woke, it meant that people were watching her with a specific intent. People she was not already aware of. She raised her head and looked around. There, in front of her, two scruffy guys walked towards her with a purpose. She looked behind her and saw a third, a girl, closing in. They were the hunting dogs, and she was the fat quail waiting to be taken. Corelli did the only thing she could do. She dug into her purse, pulled out a few red-hot candies, and ate them. The cinnamon flavor burned in her mouth and gave her confidence as it warmed her body. There was magic in the taste mixing with the sudden adrenaline of fear. And the sugar didn't hurt. Hey, Corelli, Reggie wants to see you, Mike said. Mike and Sam, she identified, Reggie's seconds. She glanced behind her and recognized Vicky's teal hair. This was quite the group to send out looking for her. It was important enough to send his top guns, but not too dangerous for the younger sister he doted upon to come. Of course, Corelli looked soft with her round purrs and extra weight. Most of the children of Anu were whip lean street kids. They assumed because she didn't look as hard as they did, she couldn't hurt them. They were so wrong. She stood her ground. What's the magic word? Now. Mike reached out and grabbed her arm. His fingers bit deep into her flesh. Corelli spoke with a deceptive calmness. Careful. You don't want to get burned, do you? 
Mike's hand on Corelli's arm burst into flame. She watched as he shouted and danced around, trying to put his hand out. Cara DeWin always hated Corelli's brand of sympathetic magic. It was too chaotic, too improvised for the woman's liking. She had always gone on about the will and the word. Whatever, she's dead and I'm not. You'll continue to burn until I stop it, Corelli said. If nothing else, it should teach you some manners. Please, Vicky stepped up. Please, would you join us for a talk? Corelli smiled a full and generous smile. Certainly. She blew on the tips of her fingers and Mike's hand stopped burning. However, need I remind any of you that you are speaking to me as a member of the first circle of the Order of the Sacred Eye or the fact that I passed your test of wood some time ago? Sam and Vicky shook their heads, but she kept her eyes on Mike. He was the one she was delivering her message to. Mike held his hand, bright red and already blistering, down by his side. No, sorry. His tone, sulky and petulant, also held a note of wary respect. Good. I'll heal that after my conversation with Reggie, if you ask nicely. Mike did not respond. Sam stepped forward. We have a car waiting. She nodded. Let's go then. Corelli could not show an ounce of the fear she felt. The children of a new respected strength and destroyed weakness. They looked at the city as their hunting grounds. They were like human sharks, and she hated dealing with them. They always saw her as prey. This time, she had no choice but to be strong and fearless and teach them that looks could be deceiving. I hope you've enjoyed your very brief foray into the city of Kendrick. If you like what you've heard, I've actually written a brand new Kendrick story for the Heroic Hearts Anthology, edited by Carrie Hughes and Jim Butcher. That anthology will be out in May. Also, this was a very big week for me. My latest Shadowrun novel, Elf in Black, was just released this week. I hope you take a look. Thank you for listening. Congratulations, Jennifer. Our final reader is Amber Royer. Amber Royer writes the Chocoverse space opera series and the Bean Jabbar mysteries. She is the author of Story Like a Journalist, a workbook for novelists, and has co-authored a chocolate-related cookbook with her husband. She also teaches creative writing and is an author coach. Amber, give us a taste of the Chocoverse. Absolutely. And I wanted to thank you for inviting me out. And since this is my first time reading with this group, I wanted to go from the first book, which is Free Chocolate. And in it, chocolate becomes Earth's only commodity in a galaxy that's hungry for it. They have copies of everything else, but the source of chocolate cacao beans, Earth has held on to. And if they keep holding on to it much longer, my protagonist is convinced that there will be war. So she puts herself in a unique position to get cacao beans off planet shortly thereafter in an attempt to sell them in a way that will help prevent war um she winds up getting shot by a galactic inspector because what she's done is highly illegal so we're going to pick up when she's by herself disillusioned on the run and when the shuttle touches down, the door opens on the silhouette of a certain galactic inspector, gun drawn, a smile on his reptilian lips. Claro, I force my own suddenly stiff mouth to move. Tyson? He dips his head at me, bringing it against his chest with that unnerving flexibility. The scales on his forehead glisten in the light, almost like flowing quicksilver. Despite the wedge-like flatness of his face, Tyson's hands aren't lizard's hands. No, y no. They're boxer's hands. And today, each flexible digit is graced with an engraved silver ring that gives him the same effect as brass knuckles. When he parts his lips, I can see his tongue because the guy's got no front teeth. You have to have front teeth to say THs. Tyson can't. Otherwise, he speaks perfect English. 
Hi, Bo. Just such a beautiful day for a trip back to Earth. Tyson barely frisks me before he picks up my backpack while keeping one surprisingly warm hand on my arm. My heart freezes as he makes a cursory inspection of the contents. He pockets my screwdriver and the devices Lula gave me before slinging the bag over his shoulder. Not that it matters. No. Someone's bound to tear that backpack apart looking for either evidence or souvenirs once I'm back on Earth. They'll find the cacao beans. I try to cover my fear. So what happened to your partner? He shrugs. I usually work along. To big cases, we team up. Space cases, guys who spend too much time alone in transit between stars, can be unpredictable and dangerous. So this should be fun. He cuffs my hands behind me, gunshot wound or no, and doesn't let me let go, let me go until he's marched me across the tarmac to his ship, which looks more like a flying saucer than a transport shuttle. I glance up at him. He blinks. I. God, he's not even looking at me, but those translucent lids drooping over his eyes send my heartbeat skyward as my flight response hits. I flinch away, and his grip on my arm gets even tighter. He looks at me like, what? I try to force my breathing down to normal as I study my own boots, and I feel my heart rate slow un poco in response. Tranquila, right? Panicking won't help. I need to get him talking to see me as a person rather than a check mark on his ledger of criminals. I nod at the saucer, then force myself to look at him. My lips only quiver a little as I say, Your ship is muy little. What's her name? The open grenade party sunshine. He licks at his top lip. I understand it loses something in translation. I'd wonder how he had such an earth-sounding name, too. It must be a translation of concepts into English. The door slides upward and a ramp descends, just like every bad science fiction movie I've ever seen. <laughs> My chest goes cold. I cannot get onto that ship. No, you know, you know, you know, you know. I back up, bumping against Tyson, feeling the panic rising inside me again, demanding that my feet run, but uh, he doesn't even seem to notice me trying to wrench my arm out of his grip. Can't we at least talk about this? I can pay you, or I'll do whatever you want. You're confusing me with a bounty hunter. I'm an officer at the law, and while I do get a commission for each case I close, I'm not in this for the money. I protect the galaxy from green mucus hate garbage danger type. Tyson pushes me ahead of him up the ramp, giving me an unobstructed view of the ship's rounded white walls of the bank of unfamiliar equipment making up the pilot station. Not all Galacticops are this noble. Why'd I have to wind up with the one that can't be bribed? He removes the cuffs and forces me into the cell, tossing my backpack in before he closes the door with a clang. Despite the prey instinct's objections, I reach a pleading hand out through the bars, catching the edge of his leather jacket sleeve. Do you know what's going to happen to me once you turn me over? Don't care. He pulls away from me, then sticks earbuds into the divots in the sides of his blade-like head. He turns the music up loud enough that I can hear it. Well, be that way, muchacho. I flop onto the surprisingly comfortable bunk molded into the wall. He sprung for decent sheets, which smell like they've just been washed, and a large, soft pillow. A guy who does that? I suspect he really does care. Eventually, I sleep, and when I wake up, something's off. We land, and a mechanic shows up to help. He turns the power off for a second, which disengages the lock on my cell. He and Tyson go outside. A gushing noise precedes a rhythmic pumping somewhere inside the walls. We must be at a refueling station. I put a hand on the cell door and push. It swings open. My tongue tries to step to the roof of my mouth as I step out into the main body of Tyson's ship, crossing to the exit door. Oi, I freeze. Tyson's headed this way. He's got his head down, peering intently into the contents of an antiquated beige paper folder. I slip under the nearest starship and crawl out the other side, trying to look casual as I search for an exit to the spaceport, which is basically an oversized piece of tarmac with refueling hoses sticking up all of it, ringed by walls too far away for me to spot over all the other ships. Tyson's yelling. He must have looked up and realized the ramp to his ship was down. The mechanic replies, then the ramp clangs as both pairs of boots race up it. Well, fantastica. I keep moving the other direction. A few seconds later, a female voice comes over the loudspeaker, speaking at first in universal standard, then in crop. 
Excuse me, the Greek Army refueling depot is now experiencing a lockdown. A green grid goes on overhead, sectioning the sky. About the time she starts repeating herself in a third tongue, I pass and begin your red ship, where the hatch looks slightly ajar. Bueno, eventually they'll have to drop the force field to let more cops in. Maybe the ship is quick enough I can use it to escape. I pull the hatch the rest of the way open and slip inside. Two voices outside the ship start speaking a language I don't comprehend. I recognize Tyson's gravelly baritone, and the other voice fades as its owner moves farther down the row. I flatten myself against the wall. My hand bumps a two-foot-long metal canister, maybe an emergency oxygen generator, maybe a fire extinguisher, clipped to it. I pull it from the wall. The hatch open, and Tyson starts to climb into the small space. Bo, oh, don't run. That's my last warning. Dios mio, how did he even figure out I was in here? I take a deep breath and duck behind the pilot's chair. I have to get around him to reach the hatch, which means I'm going to have to smack him with the canister. There's no other way out, and I am not going back into that cell. Tyson's head swivels, searching as he pulls his boots up into the ship. His spine flexes in near impossible ways, so I wait until he's mostly facing away from me. Then I hit him between the shoulder blades. The hard, heavy thud reverberates back up into my arms. I, he goes sprawling and lets out a groan. For a second, I'm frozen in shock. I didn't really expect that to work. So about a page after that, um, Tyson catches up to her and he actually bites her. And so she spends the rest of the book trying to figure out how she's going to get an anti-venin um, before things get too bad without having to actually turn herself in. And it adds this whole other layer of complication to everything else that's going on. And it's because she's running from him that she winds up on the wrong alien ship um, where mm -hmm. the kind of monstrous aliens there eat stowaways and things get even more complicated. So <laughs> it, it's a fun verse. I hope you enjoy getting a little sample. Boy, that sounds like all uh, sorts of fun complications. Thank you, Amber. And thank you so much to everyone who came today. Our next event will be on Thursday, April 21st at 7 p.m. And I'll post the pre-registration link in the chat so you can sign up right now and be sure not to miss our next amazing selection of stories. Mm -hmm.